Well, it's great to be here this morning. And uh, I was excited by the cold temperatures this morning. Uh, Isn't it so refreshing when you go outside and you just take that deep breath and fill your lungs with all that good cold air? Isn't that just a blessing? Oh, boy, oh, boy. Iguanas are falling off of trees. I mean, it is an interesting time, isn't it? Wow. You know, back in the day, in the 1800s and so forth, uh, when missionaries would go to places around the world and they would have ill health, they oftentimes wrote in their biographies that they were looking forward to getting back to New England and the cold winter air because they felt that that was good for their lungs and they just couldn't wait to get out of the heat that was causing them all of these illnesses. You read after one, after another, after another, and it's that, that way. Um, And so there's so many wonderful things happening when it's cold like this, and the mosquitoes are dying, and the ticks are dying. I mean, it's just a a reason for a hallelujah, you know what I mean? I mean, it it is a blessing. Uh, There are a few pitfalls along the way. I I hopped into the truck this morning, and and my windshield was covered with some kind of ice, I guess is what they call it. Uh, And so uh, I thought to myself, well, I'll just hit it with a de-icer. So uh, I wasn't going get, to like, get out and scrape anything. So I hit it with the de-icer and it froze solid. <laughs> Except it was blue now. <laughs> so I had to go in the garage, get the scraper out and scrape it all off and all that. But, uh, you know, again, I just opened the window up and just took another deep breath and came on up to church. Well, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I have to say, if you're a visitor with us this morning, it is your lucky day. Because I'm going to speak on giving this morning. That rarely ever happens. But you're lucky because you're here and you're visiting and this is what we're dealing with. Actually, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is a neat part of this passage uh, when you consider the whole of 2 Corinthians. Paul has had to do a lot of uh, backtracking and talking to the folks there in Corinth because uh, there were questions about his apostleship and his credibility and uh, there were issues of sin in the church at Corinth and he was uh, really pushing them to deal with that sin. And uh, as time had gone by, they actually did deal with the sin and there was time for rejoicing and there was blessing. And Paul recounts that here in 2 Corinthians. And when we come to chapter 8, what Paul is doing is he's introducing another thought for us here in chapter 8. And it kind of goes back. There's a backstory to chapter 8. The Corinthian church had, about a year before that, decided that they were going to partake in a special offering uh, for believers in Jerusalem who were going through a really rough time. And uh, they were collecting this offering from wherever, and they were going to be bringing it to the, 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 to the saints there in Jerusalem. And Corinth had decided to participate. But they never followed through by actually taking up this offering. And so Paul is going to appeal to them to follow through with this commitment and do what they said they were going to do. And so Paul begins, and he gives us two really strong illustrations uh, here in chapter 8 of people who were giving uh, and had given a great deal. And he's trying to use these methods of encouragement so that the Corinthian church will see the need to give and follow through with it. So let's look to the Lord and ask his blessing on 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And may all of our hearts be moved this morning, I pray. God, we give you thanks for this is truly a great time for us to come together and talk about this. Lord, we thank you for the admonitions in Scripture and the examples that are before us. Help us, Lord, to learn what you want us to learn today, taken directly from your word, that we might encourage one another in the days ahead. And I pray this all in Christ's name, amen. Well, there is no question when you stop and you consider the significance of of giving and you think of the biblical dynamic of giving, uh, without a doubt, you think of passages like Matthew 13, Uh, where there is someone who comes across a treasure in a field and upon finding it determines that there's nothing of greater value in the world. And so they sell everything that they have and they go and they purchase this field so that they're able to also have the treasure in it. Uh, Right after that parable, Jesus talks about the pearl of great price, of great value. And the point is that there is something that is very, very important uh, that uh, those who understand the gospel would throw off everything else in this world in order to follow Jesus Christ. Uh, There is something that is more valuable than anything else. 
And truly, that is our salvation, is it not? Is there anything more valuable than your salvation? Well, of course not. This is what your eternity hinges upon, and so it is of significance to all of us. It is impossible to put a number on it. You couldn't put a value on it. It is, without a doubt, the peak of everything that we could pursue. The dynamics of, of this passage, I'm going to say that it's the ABCs of biblical giving, and your handout sheet will show that there's an A and a B and a C, so you can kind of fill in the blanks as you may so desire. But I start off here with this big concept, and the concept is that we must all consider ourselves privileged and able to give. Now, the interesting thing is, as we look at these ABCs, one of the things that's really going to stand out, or should at least stand out, is that this is not about numbers. I'm not here to argue with anybody about giving. I'm not here to challenge you about how much you should give. I've had people call me over the years and say, well, Pastor Kevin, should I give based upon my net or upon my gross? And you get into that. It's like, do we really have time to talk about that? Well, we really don't have time to talk about that because the money itself is really not the issue. Paul begins by giving to us an illustration of the Macedonian churches. Pick this up here with me in verse 1. Now, brethren, uh, we want to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. Uh, to this point, the Corinthian church was not aware of what was given by the Macedonian church. And so Paul is saying, what I want to do is I want to familiarize you with something that's going on. He says uh, that uh, in a great ordeal of affliction, uh, their abundant, and this is an abundance of joy that they have. He says out of that abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. This church, these churches in Macedonia were very interesting because they were in a position of being uh, financially strained as well. Now, the Corinthian church is being encouraged to give because Corinth is standing alone in some ways. And this is what's happening, just so that it fills in some of the blanks. In Jerusalem, there's a famine. In Jerusalem, there's a tremendous need. The Macedonian churches are just plain poor. They don't have a lot. But Corinth, being the pivotal city that it is, and seeing the trade come and go, and, and seeing a very robust economy, they have the money to be able to give. And so here is an example of the Macedonian church, which really does not have the funding to give, and yet they are giving, the Bible says, out of this poverty that they find themselves in. Now, let me just make sure that we understand you and I, for the most part, we don't really know what poverty is. We're all pretty much rich. Say, Pastor Kevin, listen, you should see my finances. I got a big credit card bill. I, I have a car payment. I got a cell phone payment. I got a rent mortgage. I got this. I got that. I buy dog food, cat food, iguana food. I buy all kinds of stuff. And when it's all done, at the end of the day, I don't have any money. how we allocate our money, isn't it? The fact that we have all of these things demonstrates our wealth. When we talk about poverty in the scripture, we talk about the Macedonian church as being impoverished. We're talking about a subsistent lifestyle. We're talking about people who don't know where their next meal is even coming from. And so there are challenges that are enormous for them. But the reason behind their willingness to give is very unique. Now, I, I picked this up in verse 4, and it, it kind of made me smile. Because it says there uh, that uh, he says, begging us. They, they went beyond their ability to give. They gave of their own accord. They weren't forced to give. In fact, they were begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. I ought to tell you what, the, the opposite's usually true in the church today, isn't it? The church does the begging. Now, why did they have to beg? Have you ever wondered that question? Why did they have to beg? They had to beg because Paul didn't want to take their money because he knew they were poor. That's why they had to beg. 
If you've been overseas and you've done overseas ministry, you know probably what it's like to go into someone's home that is cooking a meal for you that they really can't afford to give you. But they love you so much and appreciate your, your being there so much that they're willing to do whatever it takes. Uh, when I was in China, they said uh, on Friday night, or Sunday afternoon, I guess it was, Sunday afternoon, we're, we're going to take the day off on Sunday afternoon, there's no class, and we're going over to so-and-so's house because he really, really wants us to see his home, and he wants to feed us. So we went in there, and they were preparing the food. You know where you prepare the food? On the cement floor, outside. I looked down, and I thought, hmm, I need prayer. <laughs> I mean, there were chicken feet, and there were chicken running around, they didn't have any feet, and I guess that's whose chicken they belong to. <laughs> we ate things that weren't supposed to be eaten in our country. Do you know what I mean? But they were so gracious and so humble and so thankful that we were there that they wanted, especially me, to be able to eat this wonderful food. And so uh, I started to eat things. I didn't even know what they are. You listen, you're better off not asking questions. You really are better off. You walk away, and afterwards, you might ask, and you find out you've eaten, I've, I've eaten octopus, I've eaten dog. Dog's not half bad, actually. But, uh, you know, you eat, but you see, God is, is, is using them because they want to bless you. This group of Macedonian Christians wanted to participate in helping the saints in Jerusalem so much so they came pleading with Paul, let us give, let us give. I got people calling the house every day multiple times. Hello, this is such and such. Can you give money? Do you have that? I mean, every day there's something in the mail and they want money and they're calling, calling, calling. If you give to one Christian organization, by the way, you've given to them all because they share your name and number among themselves. I get the call from every blooming Christian organization, I think, on the planet. And, and they all want money. And so uh, it, it's just amazing. These people, it's the reverse. They want to give. They want to give. You say, well, what in the world? That is really odd. I don't even think in the church, in the church we used to have to plead for people to give, don't you know? I mean, oh, please, we have this huge need. Will you financially give to this or financially give to that? And we find ourselves as Christians pleading with other Christians to give. This is not the way it is here with the Macedonian church, and Paul singles it out. Verse 5 tells us the key to their willingness to want to give. And you don't want to miss this because this is not about dollars. This is not about cents. This is not an argument over your finances, what you do or don't do with your money. Here's the key question, verse 5. In verse 5, it says there very clearly, and this, he says, not as we had expected. Paul says, we didn't expect them to beg us to want to give. But here's what they did. They first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. That's what they did. You see, they came to the understanding that everything that they had, including themselves, belonged to God. Now, that's a, that's a mindset that is not the typical mindset here in the United States, not among the Christian church in the United States. Uh, we tend to think that some of the stuff we have belongs to God. And maybe we've been taught about tithing, and we think, okay, 10% of what I have belongs to God. These people gave themselves to God. Lock, stock, and barrel, God, here I am, use me. Whatever you want to do with me in my life, Lord, here I am. There are a lot of well-meaning Christians here in the United States who love to write big checks, and that's all wonderful, but it's not the same as Christians coming to God and saying, God, here I am. Here I am. You want my money, Lord? Here it is. All of it. That's hard for us, isn't it? It's really hard for us. I want you to do this. Uh, I don't want to do that. You see, by giving to God themselves, they were saying, God, use us however you want to use us. It means when you would sit down and decide even where you're going to go to college, you're asking the question, God, where do you want me to go to college? Hmm. Huh. That's novel, isn't it? I'm going to get married. Okay. Who does God want you to marry? We don't ask those kind of questions because we haven't given ourselves to God yet. We've given some of ourselves to God, a little bit. 
This year, we, were, we made a new commitment this year, right? We're going to come to church. But they're beyond that. Do you see that? They're beyond it, way beyond it. They gave themselves to God. And by giving themselves to God, they also were willing to say, God, use us. And so they came to the Apostle Paul and said, look, we want to participate. That's the first point here. All of us can be involved in giving. You don't have to be rich to give. In, in fact, if you have millions and you give a couple of them to the Lord, that's great. But you still got millions to live on. That's why the widow in Jesus' teaching was so unique. She gets in there and she gives her last money. There was only two mites. You weren't going to do a whole lot with that in any type of economy. But the point is she gave out of her poverty, trusting that that's what God wanted her to do. And I would suggest to you that she had, first of all, given herself to God. So the first point this morning for us to stop and think about is that all of us can be involved in this giving. All of us, especially us here in this country who are so, so wealthy. The second point that we want to stop and, and think about is that the motivation for giving should be because of Jesus Christ. In fact, it says here that in this passage, uh, Paul goes on and he says, I I'm not speaking this as a command, verse 8, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. And here he's going to give a second example. His first example is the Macedonian church. The second example is Jesus Christ. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Let's make this absolutely clear, right? Jesus Christ left heaven, and I'm guessing it's pretty nice there. You know what I'm saying? Do you, do you think that there was just some really neat things going on there in heaven uh, for Jesus? Uh, that, that the angels were worshiping him, that he was on the throne, that he is king, and ki king of kings and lord of lords right there. I mean, this is, this is Jesus, and he is, no question about it, rich as he rightfully is and should be. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And he comes down to one of those meager hills in Bethlehem, and he's not even born to a rich family. He's born to a poor family. In fact, they don't even have a roof over their head. They don't even have uh, diapers for the baby. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they got nothing. They have to lay the baby in a feeding trough and wrap him up in some kind of rags that they have because they are poor, and by virtue of them being poor, he is poor too. And he would stay humbled all of his time walking on this earth. He who was rich became poor so that you and I could become rich. Now, don't, that's not a prosperity gospel thing. He's not saying you're necessarily by faith in Jesus Christ going to, to be rich economically, but spiritually you're going to go from total poverty to greatest wealth. And that's how we are as followers of Jesus Christ. Now there's a motivation for us to give, and that's what Paul is saying here. If Jesus is willing to do this, then we as his followers and out of gratitude should seek to give as well. He says, I'm giving you my opinion in this matter, for this is to your advantage, who were the first to begin a year ago, and not only to do this, but also to desire to do it. But now his admonition is, finish doing it. In Randy Acorn's book, The Treasure Principle, he quotes a friend of his by saying, we're most like God when we are giving. Gaze upon Christ long enough and you'll become more of a giver. Give long enough and you'll become more like Christ. Christ's grace defines, motivates, and puts in perspective our giving. He goes on to say, our giving is a reflective response to the grace of God in our lives. It doesn't come out of our altruism or philanthropy. It comes out of the transforming work of Christ in us. In other words, we're not giving because we just 
want to be a philanthropist. We, we're not giving because it makes us feel good. We are giving because we have been touched by the grace of God and we so want others to be trust, uh, trusting in Christ and experiencing the grace of God as well. Amen? Shouldn't that be our desire? And so it's an exciting opportunity. He goes on, he says, we give because he first gave to us. As thunder falls lightning, giving falls grace. When God's grace touches you, you can't help but respond with generous giving. As the Macedonians knew, giving is simply the overflow of joy. Wow. You and I have the opportunity to give, and it's pretty exciting, isn't it? We are, as believers, uniquely motivated to give. And it's a blessing for us to be able to do that. Because our Savior, Jesus Christ, he makes the ultimate gift. He gives the greatest gift. And now we have the opportunity to be involved in his work and in his ministry. Isn't that great? Well, what a blessing it is. I I hope that we would look at it that way. Certainly the Macedonian church viewed it that way. They were excited about the opportunity to take the very bread off their table that they were going to eat that very day and be able to give it knowing that God would bless it and use it. Paul would go on to say that this is not something that you're doing in order to cause yourself affliction, but he says in verse 13, for this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction. You're not giving to others so that you would be afflicted and they would be eased, but he says by way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need. That there may be equality, as it's written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. You look at that passage, and it's kind of confusing with the the talk there going both ways. But he's saying that you have been blessed, and you have abundance, and you're supplying their need, so that when they have abundance, they may become a supply for your need. And here, I'm not sure he's just saying, listen, they're going to be blessed, and someday they'll give back to you. But I think he's really trying to say here that as you give, to meet their need, your need spiritually will be met by that. You will be blessed spiritually as you have the opportunity to give. Well, that's an encouragement, isn't it? Well, Paul doesn't end there, and this comes to the third point here, and that is we should be interested in how churches and organizations that we contribute to uh, are accountable. I want you to see this in this passage because it's right out of these, these very verses that we find this point. Uh, Paul says, but thanks be to God, verse 16, who puts the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he has gone to you of his own accord. We have sent along with him the brother whose fame in the things of the gospel is spread throughout all the churches. So let's understand there are three people who are involved in delivering and administering this gift, this generous sum of money. I don't know how much money this is. Could be tens of thousands of dollars, equivalent or more. Paul is a trustworthy person. Would you agree with me that that's true? Would you trust Paul to take this offering by himself to Jerusalem? Paul says, I'm not doing it by myself. I'm also going to take Titus, who has a great reputation. And not only that, I'm going to take so-and-so, who's known to all of you, and he's going to be the third person in this, so that there is a great testimony before the Lord. See see how this works out. He says, and not only this, but he has also been appointed by the churches, this third person, to travel with us in the gracious work which is being administered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our readiness. Taking precaution, do you see that? Taking precaution so that no one will discredit us in our administration of this generous gift. For... We have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. Paul is absolutely concerned with the testimony that he would have before the world. How he distributes this funding is absolutely a reason for accountability. He wants there to be accountability. And I believe that as followers of Christ... And I believe this applies to churches and Christian organizations that we might contribute to. There needs to be accountability. 
many places there's not accountability. In fact, you get a kick out of this, but I went uh, and Googled something, and you Google stuff, it's amazing what you can find. I just Googled this. List of pastors arrested for fraud. And I printed off more pages than I even brought. Uh, over here in Alexandria last year, there was a husband and pastor and his wife charged with $1.2 million fraud. Hmm. A local pastor arrested on felony insurance fraud. A Columbus pastor who claimed his family was robbed of $11,000 while he was preaching in church. Well, they started digging around. They found out some insurance fraud was going on. He went to jail. Cameron Banks of Georgetown has been charged in a seven-count federal indictment with health care fraud and an alleged scheme to submit fraudulent loan applications for dental services. Creflo Dollar, you remember him? Yeah, he ran a scam. He wanted to get people to put up money so that he could buy some kind of fancy jet. He already had, I don't know how many planes, but he wanted one of these real fancy ones. He got in trouble for that. Detroit pastor falls from grace and gets prison for fraud. He's run out of the church. Wow. July 2nd, 2015, he and his co three cohorts were charged in a criminal complaint with wire fraud and ex uh, access device fraud. Pastor arrested in a fraud scheme at a charter school. Jacksonville man claiming to be a pastor arrested. Pastor arrested on money laundering charges. Middle Tennessee uh, <laughs> exposed on Channel 4 News. Lakewood struggling to move past fraud charges. I mean, it's on and on. There were pages and pages on the internet. You see, there's a need for accountability, isn't there? There is a need. Uh, I believe that uh, this need for accountability is right back here, all the way back in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And the Apostle Paul is concerned as to the testimony before the Lord and the testimony before man. You and I have an obligation when we give to know that the places where we give are fully accountable and transparent in how the money is being spent. Those are all very, very necessary things. So what are our takeaways from this passage of Scripture? Well, today's thoughts, I believe, number one, we all must consider ourselves privileged to be able to give. And every one of us, no matter how much or how little we have, can give to the Lord. Out of gratitude, we should give because we desire to see the gospel prosper and other people forgiven and redeemed. And third of all, we should be interested in how churches and organizations that we give to allocate their funds and spend God's money. Remember, the key is everything we have belongs to the Lord. We give ourselves to God and God takes over from there and he has it all. He has it all. He has where we go, what we do, how much we spend, what we don't spend, and it's all his. You and I oftentimes don't have the opportunity that this fellow had. Alfred Nobel was an interesting fellow. Uh, he was a man who uh, he, he is credited for being able to um, say that he invented some different things. One of the things that he invented was plywood. I didn't realize that. Um, I always wondered where that came from and who thought that up. Uh, but Alfred Nobel was an interesting person. He, um, he's also credited with uh, developing dynamite. Uh, he found that uh, in meeting with the person who discovered nitroglycerin, that nitro was a little bit funky and uh, would tend to blow yourself up. And so he decided to find something that was less volatile. And so he ended up developing dynamite. In Randy Alcorn's book, he says this. He said, Alfred Nobel dropped the newspaper and put his head in his hands. It was 1888. Nobel was a Swedish chemist who made his fortune inventing and producing dynamite. His brother Ludwig had died in France. But now Alfred's grief was compounded by dismay. He just read an obituary in a French newspaper. It was not his brother's, but it was his. An editor had confused the brothers, and this is what the newspaper printed about Alfred Nobel. The headline read, The Merchant of Death is Dead. Alfred Nobel's obituary described a man who had uh, come to, to wealth uh, over the demise of many. And he was viewed as the merchant of death because so many uh, of his ordinances were used in battle. It gave him the opportunity to look at his life in a very different way, and he decided that what he was going to do was try to improve on his obituary headline. 
And so he started by making an endowment uh, for what would be known as the Nobel Prizes. When we think of Nobel, we do not think of someone who invented plywood or dynamite. We don't think of him as the merchant of death. We think of the, the, the Nobel Prize, and we think of the Nobel Prize for things like peace. And that was what he intended to do. Now, the thing that the Macedonians knew was the reality of this scripture, where it says in Matthew, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So let me ask you the question this morning, where is your heart? That's the key question in this passage. Would you agree that verse 5 speaks the same of you as it does of the churches in Macedonia, where they first gave themselves to the Lord? Let's pray. As we bow our heads before the Lord today, you may be here this morning, and you may have questions about where you're going to spend your eternity. Maybe it's a relationship with Christ that's lacking. Maybe you're here, you're hearing this for the first time. Maybe you're hearing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. It's the first time you're hearing that. Uh, that's awesome. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so the question is, have you ever called upon him? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you know that your sins have been forgiven? Christ has accomplished everything that you need by going to the cross. He paid it all. Paid it in full. God who is holy will not subject those who are in Christ to a moment, moment of, of judgment. But you will pass from judgment to life. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? God's working at your heart today. I pray that you won't leave here until you've made that decision. Maybe you're here this morning and you know Christ as your Savior. Let me encourage you to stop and think about how much does God have of you? Does he have your whole being? Are you inclined to argue over money? argue over giving if that's the case it tells the story doesn't it if god's at work in your heart my prayer is that you'll submit to him and you'll know the blessing these people who were poor in macedonia are called out because of their abundance of joy do you have abundance of joy this morning is that what marks your life doesn't matter how much we have or how much we don't have. The blessings of this life come from our walk with Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you. For your word, Lord, is so accurate as it speaks to our hearts. And Father, if there's someone here this morning who's not sure of their eternal destination, how I pray, Lord, that today they would submit their heart to you. That they would take hold of Jesus Christ and place their faith and trust in him alone. Knowing that he is the only way to have eternal life. The only way to be reconciled to a holy God as sinful human beings. How I pray that they would acknowledge their sin and their need for Jesus, their Savior. And Father, I pray that those of us who know you as Savior would be reminded that, Lord, we're to be set apart for you so that you truly have all of us. Take us, Lord, today. Use us, I pray, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Well, this morning, just before you leave, and we will have uh, folks here at the front, if you have questions about uh, Jesus Christ, what a relationship really means, if you have questions about 
your own walk with the Lord, something troubling you, you want to talk with someone or pray with someone, we have folks here at the front who are more than happy to, to meet with you afterwards. Um, just a couple of announcements, actually three announcements that uh, I want to make. And one has to do with this date that flashed up uh, last week on the screen. A couple of people said, hey, what is, you know, February 11th? And uh, so I want to tell you about this uh, February 11th and just kind of introduce what's going to be happening. We have uh, a theme that we want to roll out for 2018. And the theme kind of goes like this. Uh, It talks about worshiping together. It talks about learning together. And lastly, serving together. When we stop and we think about worshiping together, we think of our worship service. And I guess that's a natural place to stop and think. And so there's some changes that are coming and I know how much we as Christians love change. And so uh, uh, we want to roll this out so that you, you hear about it over the next few weeks. And so one of the things that you want to keep in mind is there's a service time change. For those who are in the first service, I said to them, just come February the 11th at 9 o'clock and you can leave at 10 just like normal. You won't know the world has changed. Uh, but for you guys, it's a little bit different. Those of you who come late... <coughs> um, you won't notice the change. It's kind of like, <laughs> what earthquake? <laughs> but for those of you who like to be on time, you will notice something because we will be starting at 11 instead of 1045. That's the worship together aspect. Now, the learning together aspect is we were creating a time in between two services. That's the, what we've been trying to do and trying to get our service times down to an hour. And so it's going to be vitally important because at 1010, we'll be starting our adult Bible fellowship classes, our ABFs. Now, many of you come during the first service and you come to a Bible study class right now. And so what you'll be doing is you'll come and you will go to the class in between and then you'll stay for the second service. Uh, or you could come for the first service and stay for the class. We want to kind of cross-pollinate, and people in the first service that don't know you in the second service, it's like you go to different churches. But you'll have the opportunity to go to an ABF, an adult Bible fellowship class, uh, and we're expanding the space for all these classes. I'll talk more about that in the weeks ahead. But you'll have the opportunity to study God's Word during that middle portion, that middle time. We'll have children's ministries just like they are now, first and third, uh, second service, and there'll be a junior church, which is a bit different during this uh, learning time together for the kids. But there'll be something for everyone at all of these services, at all of these uh, ministry points. Now, I know as we look at that, we think to ourselves, well, it's a little tight. It's going to have some challenges. I don't have all the answers for you. I know that there'll be bumps in the road. I know we'll be working on that. Please pray for this. Pray that God would bless it and that it would accomplish what we're desiring to see accomplished. Um, I know it's doable because I've, I've visited places that have done this. Um, in fact, uh, Karen and I were visiting a church uh, several months ago to, to see some of the impact of how they were doing things. And they actually had a five-minute turnaround time. And there was about a thousand of them there in that auditorium. So um, pretty amazing. But uh, it's doable, but I know that there'll be bumps, as I said. So some things that are changing, learning together, and then serving together, we're hoping uh, that there'll be more opportunities to be involved in different ministries when you have the opportunity and you can't say, well, I have to be in two places at one time. This will give you options to be able to serve. We'll talk more about this as the time moves forward. Um, And next week specifically, I'll answer the question, why the change? Why were we doing this? What are we trying to accomplish by doing this? Are we just trying to to do it just for fun? Uh, No, not at all. There is a purpose behind it. So I'll talk more about that next week. But I just want to roll this out. It takes time to roll these things out and let all of you know so that if you have questions, you can ask about them and so forth, or you want to see how this is going to fit. I'm hoping that over the next few weeks that most of the questions that you have will be answered. So stay tuned, all right? Two other things that are going on. You can sign up for Men's Fraternity. We start tomorrow night. We're excited about that. Seven o'clock. I think there's 40, 50 guys already signed up. So make sure you sign up. Also, uh, tonight, we have a special event tonight where we are joining together to pray, and we encourage you to come. It's an all-church prayer meeting. Uh, We'll be here. Uh, It's cold outside, but it's warm inside, and uh, we'll be here to pray, and uh, we'll be praying for our 
missions and uh, missionaries and some other things as well. So I just want to encourage you to come out to pray tonight, all right? Let's stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for our time together worshiping you this morning. We thank you, Father, for the many blessings that you have poured out upon us. Help us, Lord, in this week ahead to... um, to accomplish those things that uh, you are putting before us. For we know, Lord, that there are opportunities that come to us each and every day. Bless these changes, Lord, that are being spoken of, Lord. We pray, Father, that um, even through the bumps and the, and the difficulties, Lord, that uh, you will just give us answers and direction, that, Lord, we would be dependent upon you for your guidance and your provision may accomplish those things, Lord, that um, we desire, for we know, Lord, that those things will be pleasing to you. And we thank you again. Bless each one now as we go our separate ways. Bring us back together tonight to pray, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.